Bonjour. Uh, I, my name is Kay, as you just heard. And today I'm going to be talking to you about how to hack your brain frame in order to fit into a variety of situations um, that you might not otherwise. I'm going to draw from my own experience for this. I'm openly neurodivergent. Uh, I also have several chronic conditions which leave me disabled, even though I look pretty normal, I'm sure. So I'm drawing from that experience and from my time spent as an executive of teams who create security awareness content. So just quickly, this is my disclaimer saying that this is all mine. This has nothing to do with the company that I work for, et cetera, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. So this is what we're going to talk about today. Some of you may have heard of a guy named Wynn Schwartow. Uh, I highly suggest going to see his talk later. But he is my mentor. And he, about 15 years ago, created a talk called Hiring the Unhirable. So that's how we're going to kick things off. We're going to talk about what life is like with disabilities and then lead into creating your own user manual. So Hiring the Unhirable. This was a talk that he gave many times, uh, wrote about many times. And basically, his experience in the world of hackers and in his own life helped him realize that the hiring crisis in cyber is partly of its own creation, because many positions are biased against the best talent from the start. And a lot of that is based on the fact that so many of us in this industry are some flavor of neurodivergent. So he is an older white guy, uh, the face of privilege from the outside. But in fact, he discovered he had his own series of disabilities back in 69 when he, went to, when he was offered a job by Bell Labs and quickly discovered that he could not actually do that job because he's colorblind. And this is a picture of what the cable looks like. So there's no way he could tell a difference between which color was which, which wire was which color. The very next day after he found this out, he went across the street to IBM, and they offered him a job. But he was a hippie. He had long hair. Uh, he did not feel like being like Ross Perot in this image here. Uh, suit and tie, crew cut. It just wasn't his vibe. So right off the bat, he's experiencing forms of discrimination that you might not be able to see if you just looked at him. So years later, when he got into cyber, he discovered, oh, well, people are saying that they need talent, that there's not enough people in this industry to go around. And that's still the case. But he realized that it was because of all of these barriers to entry that people were experiencing. So, in this industry, we're really good at saying no, uh, at deciding, you know what, we can't do that. Knee jerks, passing the blame, ignoring the obvious, kissing ass, drinking the PC Kool-Aid. Uh, but in fact, if we could just get over these outdated, strict guidelines about hiring, then we could hire more people. Basically, we need to hire more from the spectrum, from people who have disabilities and a diversity of backgrounds and experiences. There's so many people who we consider our mentors, heroes, really smart, influential people who either admit themselves that they're on the spectrum, or if, if it's far enough in history, we can kind of assume some things. But yeah, as you see here, not only in just STEM uh, professions, but also in other professions. There's many actors who are autistic, um, and there's a lot of overlap as well between autism and ADHD. 
So if you're going to hire someone who's on the spectrum, this is what he said to expect. Social awkwardness, if you don't want the truth, don't ask for it. <laughs> um, a lot of hyper-focus, a lot of time on your own, getting into good flow states, odd dress, uh, because we don't tend to care quite as much about social norms or taboos. Um, no life, because generally, if you're neurodivergent, your life is whatever you're super into, your special interests. But the thing is, you get those special gifts of neurodiversity if you're hiring for those people. If you're paying attention to what they need, uh, then you get the benefit of that superpower that neurodivergent, neurodivergence has. You get the, the hyper-focus, the ability to go through lines and lines and lines of code and pick out the missing semicolon. You, you have the ability to work ridiculous hours, <laughs> because once you get into something, it's hard to get out of it. Um, and if you're in this industry and you're neurodivergent, chances are this is your special interest. So you're going to be into it for a, an infinite number, uh, an infinite length of time. So if you want to hire neurodivergent people, then you're going to have to give them these things. Hacker cons, like this one, uh, because again, special interests, we like to talk to other geeks, we don't quite understand why other people don't get it, but when you're at hacker cons, it feels like family. Um, basically, you give these people some, anything that makes them feel comfortable and supported. So, <laughs> so um, in 2011, I was in need of a job. I was fresh out of college. Even though I had been a script kitty hacker in high school, uh, I went to school for art, which isn't exactly a marketable skill to have. <laughs> so I moved to Nashville, Tennessee in the US, and I responded to a Craigslist ad. And the ad was pages long, very weird, <laughs> eccentric, uh, but it sounded like it was almost too good to be true. So I responded to an ad, I went to a stranger's house, I do not recommend doing that, but it worked out for me. <laughs> so he gave me a job, and within a year I was fully remote, I got to work from home, and we created this environment called Row which is results-only work environment. That means it doesn't matter if you clock in right on the top of the hour. It doesn't matter if you leave during the day to run errands, to go to the grocery store, to pick up your kids. What really matters is that you're providing results. And that gave me and the people that we hired later a lot of flexibility and helped create this safe space for a variety, a diversity of people. So we continued that unconventional hiring process, and if, if it weren't for when taking the time to talk about those things, to be passionate about those things, and not just that, but walk that walk, not just talk the talk, I wouldn't be here today. Like I said, he's my mentor, but this is why. And although it's, it's often considered taboo to think of your workmates as your family. This team that we put together through the security awareness company, that's how it feels. It's a rock solid team and almost all of those people are still together today. I'm, I'm leading that same team, uh, much more expanded, different ownership, but all those people are still around. There's virtually 0% voluntary attrition over several years because of the environment that we're able to create. So by 2015, I was the first non-family hire. By 2015, we had grown to this size, 
And then in 2016, we grew a bit more. 2017, even more. 2018, <laughs> and finally, 2019. And like I said, there are, there are more people now to this team, and almost all of them are still around. So what's that secret sauce? Basically, like I said, neurodiversity has specific relevant gifts to give to cyber. It's not a mistake that so many of us are neurodivergent. So you also need to create a supportive environment for real humans, which means not only do you need to support maybe those eccentricities, but remember that people are just people. We're all humans. We all have our flaws, our quirks, and we all have gone through things. We're all experiencing things that aren't on the surface. Just remember that the people that are working with you or for you are humans, they're not drones. <laughs> it's also important to embrace the experience of failure and, again, provide that safe space for failure. Because, as, as Wynne has said before, you don't want to hire a cybersecurity expert who's never failed. You want someone who has failed and knows how to come back from that. Adaptive incentives and rewards, again, some people prefer this, some people prefer that. Some people like to take a week of vacation. Some people like to go to hacker conferences. Allow those incentives and rewards to be adaptable to the people that you're hiring. And most importantly, in my opinion, is to lead with compassion. Our team is rock solid because we've created this culture of teamwork. Everyone is more than willing to step up and help out, no matter what, whether it's your direct job or not. So what is it like living with disabilities? Like I said, I look normal, but I put this picture up here because this is me in a hospital bed, and it helps kind of bridge that gap between what you see and what might be happening behind the scenes. I created this horrible chart to show the ways in which I've experienced different forms of discrimination throughout my life. I was raised in a very rural, mountainous area, very isolated, very backwards, and that has resulted, once I got out of that place, in a lot of classism and cultural racism because of where I was raised. Um, I'm also queer, and trans non-binary, and so I've cut off contact with most of my family because of that, unfortunately. But the biggest here are ableism and sexism. I was born a woman, and therefore I've just had to fight harder from the start to be taken seriously and to be in a space like this. But the ableism is really what we're focusing on today. It's, it's important for me to be transparent about things like this because I feel the taboo of it all is what ends up with people like me feeling lonely or like no one else understands. Um, and talking about it helps make sure that other people are aware of the things that people like me might need. So you don't have to read all this, but I'm an etymology geek. And so I wanted to look at the difference between adaptation and accommodation, because there's a subtlety there. And people like me with disabilities, we are expected to adapt to whatever circumstance we're in, which is often why we feel even more disabled than we might be. We have to adapt to a society that doesn't think about us at all where, in my opinion, it would be much better to strike a balance between that adaptation and accommodation, where we can meet halfway. The thing is, once you discover that you have a disability, you can't ever go back. You are changed forever. I, myself, didn't get diagnosed with my disabilities until I was well, it was just a few years ago, so in mid-30s. 
And even though I'd lived my whole life with these things, I didn't know. So I just thought something was wrong with me. I thought I wasn't good enough, I wasn't trying hard enough, what have you. But in spite of that little bit of relief that I got in knowing that I wasn't crazy, <laughs> there's still no turning back. I have to advocate for myself. I have to make sure that I have the things and the supports that I need. And disability can take forms that we might not expect. Like I said, you, you can look at me and think that I'm probably a relatively healthy person, but that is not the case at all. Disabilities can affect your senses, how you move, how you think, what your memory is like, how strong it is, how you learn, how you communicate, your mental health, your societal relationships, and your behavior. There are all these extra bits on top of it, such as environmental factors, which can make all of that much worse. It's easy to imagine someone who is in a wheelchair, who has a supportive family, who has friends who love them, who will drop anything if they need to go somewhere, if they need something, versus someone in that same scenario who is in a hostile family environment, who feels alone and has no friends whatsoever, has no way to communicate with the outside world. Even though they have the same disability, one has a much, much worse experience compared to the other. So again, just re-establishing that you can't see disability. Most of the time, you cannot see disability. So I'm, lead, I'm saying all this to lead up to why I'm saying it's a good idea to create a user manual for yourself. It's not my own idea, but I heard it maybe 10 years ago, and it's an idea that stuck with me, because I, I did go through the exercise of thinking, if I had a user manual, if I was going to give my user manual to another person, what would, it, what would be in it? What would the components of that look like? And it's a really effective exercise, just in general, because it can help you figure out what you need specifically. If you don't know what you need or what you can ask for, then you're not going to ask for it or advocate for it. So most user manuals, I've focused mostly on a software manual, have these five components. You have your system requirements, which if you think about that for yourself, what are your optimal operating conditions? What are your system requirements like? How do you best install yourself into a new situation or when you're applying yourself to something you've never done before? What does your component diagram look like? In, in that way, what, what are you made up of? What is your personality like? What are some key highlighted experiences that you've had? Do you have specific skills? How are you best used as software? Do you have specific quests that you would like to go on, specific things you would like to learn, specific experiences you would like to experience? And most importantly, what debugs you when you're stalled out? So looking at each of the, these a little more in depth, what are your system requirements? This can be things like, what hours do you work best? Are you a night owl? Do you best work when it's dark outside? Or are you a morning person? If you are, I don't understand you at all, but I, I appreciate you. <laughs> do you have a preference on where you like to work? Would you prefer to work at home? Or would you prefer to work around other people? Do you need that accountability of other people seeing you do work? Or do you need the flexibility and the isolation of your home where you can control the environment? What sort of team do you want to work on? Do you want to work on a team, or would you rather be a lone ranger? What are your motivations? What is your incentive for wanting to work somewhere? And specifically, especially when it comes to neurodivergence, how can you achieve flow state? If you don't know what flow state is, it's that beautiful space of time where everything falls away and it's just you and what you're doing. 
And that can be a precious, precious asset, especially for neurodivergence. And it's easily interrupted as well. So if you need uninterrupted flow state, then perhaps you shouldn't look into a job where you have to talk to people a lot throughout the day. What's the best approach for doing something new? The install section. What is the best flow of information? If you're starting a new job, would you prefer to have that information given to you all at once? Would you prefer to have it dripped to you over a series of days? What do you need that format to look like? Do you learn better through videos? Do you learn better through uh, wikis? And how do you deal with unexpected change versus planned change? I'm autistic, so unexpected change is the worst to me. But some people really like spontaneity. Uh, my partner has ADHD, and they love spontaneity. It's an interesting combination. <laughs> and finally, what, what would your best mentor look like? Who do you need to look for to help you to that next step? What does your brainware package contain? Um, I just realized I have copied the same bullets from the last slide, so that's interesting. <laughs> but again, this is your personality traits, your quirks. Um, uh, maybe you've heard of the Myers-Briggs tests, where you get four to five letters, like ENFP, uh, ISTJ, things like that. What does that say about you and how you work best? Do you, do you have specific quirks or eccentric, eccentricities that affect your work? Um, do you prefer to turn things in at the beginning of day and read email at the end of the day. It can be anything that you need it to be. For your user experience, what do you do best and what do you want to do? What are your strengths? And be honest about your weaknesses as well. There's a connotation with the word weakness, especially if you're someone who is dealing with disabilities, but they're important. It's important to be aware of the transparent nature of your whole person, because that's how we can grow and change and develop. Do you have leadership potential, or would you rather do anything else except leadership? Are you quiet, or do you like to talk? Would you rather do voice calls, or would you rather type? Do you have specific projects that you want to work on? Do you have specific projects that you do really well? And finally, the debug step. We all need a little bit of debugging and defragging sometimes ourselves, at least I do. So what does that look like for you? What do you do when you start to feel like you're getting burned out? How do you deal with stress and anxiety, and what can you do to combat that? For me, it's hanging out with cats and dogs and cute little animals. But again, that's just me. Do you, when you're coming up against conflict with someone, how do you deal with conflict, and how might you do that better? The goal here is to see how you work as a person and ultimately figure out how that can fit into other teams, other scenarios, other situations, so that you can be a better person, a better worker, you can advocate for yourself. So what's the impact of doing this? Why, why even do this at all? Why is this all connected? In my opinion, and again, perhaps I'm biased, but I feel this is a valuable tool. It's important to know yourself, because again, as I keep saying, that's the only way you can advocate for what you need and know as well when you're in a scenario that is not good for you. Without judgment, some scenarios just aren't good for me. Like, if I'm in a very crowded place, I'm going to get very agitated and 
likely be at risk for a meltdown. <laughs> but that's just me. I can advocate for not being in those spaces because I know that. Ultimately, this creates a more inclusive experience because in the process of creating your own user manual, perhaps you come upon insights that help you understand why you appear in certain situations in a certain way or why, uh, sorry, my brain died. Again, neurodivergent, <laughs> apologies. <laughs> but yes, it creates a more inclusive experience because you're able to, once you take the time to review yourself, it makes you a bit more intrigued about what's going on under the surface of others as well, or at least that's my hope. Because as you learn to adapt your environment for your own needs, you're able to create supportive environments for others as well. You're able to respond more from empathy and compassion because you might realize, wait, there is more here underneath the surface, even if you don't deal with disabilities. And most importantly, if you're in a scenario where you can share this experience with other people, you, you can allow them to have a peek into your world, to understand what it likes to navigate your world, and vice versa, which is really important as humans, in my opinion. So I, I can see this being used for self-improvement, obviously, but it can be used at, in a professional scenario as well. I could see this being a team-building exercise where you combine them and create a user manual for your team. You can also use this in education or counseling uh, for kids in higher ed, for your own kids, for someone else's kids, who knows. But again, it's important to keep that bit at the core of finding out about yourself so that you can feel supported and advocate for yourself. But the thing is, we, I'm not enti entirely blind to the type of world that we live in. I, I live in it too. <laughs> so even though there's a trend moving in this direction, we still have to get back down on the corporate level, on the business level, if, if we're going to implement anything like this. Because the fact is most companies still run opposite to this idea of making sure people are supported and that they have the things they need to do their best work. So if you're in a scenario where you've gone through this exercise and you would like to pitch to your boss, to HR, hey, I need X, Y, or Z, then it's important for you, especially if you're getting any sort of pushback or the corporate culture just isn't, isn't in that place of um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, connect your requests into how it's going to improve your specific performance. I need, I need to work from home because the distractions in an office make it so that I can never get my work done, which is, which is actually true. <laughs> but connect that in. Show how you are actually going to produce more, perform better with certain accommodations. It's also important if you're dealing with disabilities to educate yourself on regulations that are relevant to you. Um, each country has its own sort of accessibility accommodations regulations, and those can be really important for you when you're in a scenario and you're trying to advocate for yourself because you can fall back on the law but the thing is, too, it's also good because it, could, it can also show you ways in which you can ask for accommodation. For example, in the US, there's a website, askjan.org, Job Accommodation Network, I believe. And it's a searchable database of all sorts of um, 
disabilities and specifically what those disabilities often ask for in terms of accommodation. It can help you have the words if you don't have them. Again, autistic, so that words can be hard sometimes for me. So let's sum all of this up. What is it like out here? <laughs> As I said, we're still working on it. There's still a lot of hiring policies that just create a barrier for entry for people like me right off the bat. And it's through things like this, doing this kind of talk, spreading awareness, advocating for others, speaking up, that's how those things change. In my opinion, though, the most insidious of the challenges is the societal stigma related to disability. And that's a multi-layered, complex thing, because as I just barely touched on, disability is multifaceted. There are all sorts of ways in which disability affects a person. And especially given a lot of those things happen under the surface, it can be even harder to get people to take you seriously. I, as someone who is autistic, I often get, well, you don't look autistic. What does autistic look like? What does that look like? It doesn't, it, it, we're all individuals. That's what it looks like. It looks individual just like humans are. <laughs> so f fighting against those societal stigmas is absolutely the hardest part. But again, advocating and awareness is the key to overcoming those things. And finding supports that can help you, those support nets when you need a little bit of extra push, a little bit of hype. So within this, though, there are hopeful places, as I say. It is becoming more of a norm and relevant to us geeks. A lot of fun assistive tech is continuing to come out that helps people with a variety of disabilities and challenges. I believe it was just last week that I saw someone with a brain-computer interface. I don't know if it was Neuralink, but I saw someone with a BCI beat Dark Souls using their brain. And if you know Souls, <laughs> that's huge. It's not like they were beating the old Super Mario. <laughs> it's Dark Souls. So things are progressing and getting a lot better. Ultimately, this has been the phrase that has helped me the most when I'm totally burned out for, with advocating for myself. Because I have to. No one's going to do that for me, unfortunately. So when I feel the worst, most of the time I still have to take the time and energy to advocate for myself. So that gets, that's a bit of a bitter pill to swallow. But someone told me the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And I've also heard the squeaky wheel gets the doesn't get the grease, it gets replaced, but we're going to ignore that entirely. <laughs> so the squeaky wheel gets the grease. No one's going to know that you need grease unless you squeak. So squeak, squeak, squeak. Reach out, speak up, ask for help. Seek out your own resources. We have the internet. I don't know if you guys knew that. But you can Google things now. <laughs> and there are so many meetups out there. There are advocacy groups that you can reach out to, networks, private interest groups on LinkedIn, any number of social platforms. Just remember, you have to squeak to get the grease. So, key takeaways. This is what I want you to walk away from this with. If, if, you're, if you're dealing with disabilities or other similar challenges, don't isolate yourself. Don't give in to the dark spiral of loneliness. Reach out and find other people who are like you, because you're not alone. You are absolutely not alone. 
there are plenty of people out there dealing with similar things, and there are plenty of people as well who are creating safe spaces for you to talk and connect and network with others. There are even specific job networks that you can search and find uh, jobs that are accessibility forward. They're already willing to help you out from the start because they get this kind of thing. Second, if you're comfortable, share your own story, just as I'm sharing mine, because that's how we educate people. That's how we make this a normal thing. It's not taboo. We're not hiding people behind doors and in state mental asylums anymore. <laughs> we have the ability to speak up and advocate for ourselves in a way that we never have before. So do it if you, if you can, if you're comfortable. Do it because we need more voices. We need to show that we exist and that we have important gifts and talents. Three, surface level is surface level. You can't see what's going on under the surface. So even though it's human instinct to make those snap judgments, try to start pausing that a bit. Get a bit more interested in what someone might be experiencing under the surface or have experienced. It can help you with that compassionate edge. Because again, we're all just humans. Life is hard. We're all struggling with it and doing the best we can. Number four, what is your utopia? This is a win question that he asks me and others all the time, and I love it. Because the real idea here in creating your user manual is to figure out your utopia so that you can make that happen. If you don't know what your utopia is, you're never going to reach it. It's important for you to take the time. And again, hopefully it leads to that curiosity about what's going on under the surface for others as well. And finally, stay resilient and positive, especially if you're dealing with disabilities and challenges. Stay resilient and positive. Tomorrow will be another day. Next week will be another week. Be very gentle with yourself and give yourself the most grace because it's hard out here. <laughs> And if you're dealing with disabilities on top of how hard it is, it's even harder. <laughs> so that, that is my talk. I uh, will be pushing this concept further. I've created a, um, a character builder that is similar to uh, tabletop RPGs, D&D, &D, if, if there are any other Dungeons and Dragons nerds in here. It basically gives you a set of cyberpunk style characters, ability scores, and that kind of thing, and helps you create a character. Uh, and it's just another fun, gamified way to view this stuff and see what it's like for others. So yeah, I'll, I'll be doing some stuff on that in the future if you would like to keep up with it, but other than that, I'm, I've got five minutes for questions if anyone has them. Thank you, Kay. That was an awesome talk and very inspirative. Thank you. Uh, we will have a Q&A session, like uh, if someone have a question, please raise your hand and stand ah. here. Jason has one. Any, Jason. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So this is not exactly a question. I oh. just want to thank you for your sharing. Oh, thank you. Thank you for being comfortable. <laughs> of course. Thank you. And as you said, it's not easy out here, and uh, good <laughs> luck. And I hope that we can change my with the presentation like this. Thanks Thank again. you. I appreciate that. 
Un micro pour Jason, s'il vous plaît, en bas. À gauche. He's coming. <laughs> So, especially for uh, like when you're at events like this, yeah. what are some of your coping mechanisms when you're overstimulated or overwhelmed and you just, what are some of the good ones? Because it's like, I have to work on that as well. It's like, yeah. it's like so how do you do it when you're trying to get downtime to regenerate? Re yeah. Honestly, I just did this in the airport yesterday on the way here. I find the biggest, furthest, darkest bathroom stall and I just sit there. Um, that's if, if I really need to get away and there's nowhere, I'll just hang out in the bathroom for a little bit. Um, I also like to go outside. I have a lot of secret stims that I do, uh, especially twirling my hair. Um, if, if I'm feeling really overwhelmed, then I try to find the smoker section outside just because there's not as many people, you might get the cool breeze, the fresh air, and that's also kind of a place where it's okay to kind of stand off by yourself. So that's another, another way. Um, a lot of times I just dissociate and glaze over. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I try to just, it's the bathroom or the smoker section, those are my two go-tos. Anyone? Okay. So Thanks. Please have a nice year for Kay. Merci.